there's nothing like bringing along your own fan club, you know, it just gets everything started out just right. A few weeks ago, I had a, a tweet from a friend of mine, a gentleman I served in the military with a number of years back, and he had had the occasion to meet Kyle Froman. And this was at an event up at Andrews Air Force Base, if I'm not mistaken. And my friend Kevin has gotten involved in working on pit crew when, he has, when he's available on some stock car races, and he just really enjoys it. So he and Kyle had connected while they were there, and he told Kyle, said, hey, a friend of mine lives in Nashville, you ought to make connection with him. So Kyle obliged me, we got together and spent about an hour and a half over a cup of coffee just talking about the, the very unique ministry that they have at MRO. And I just wanted him to come today and share about that. Not that everyone here is necessarily interested or involved in NASCAR or other racing forms, but just the ministry component itself, how it came about and the impact that it has, which I think is so important to us because as a church is trying to figure out what it is God wants us to do, as much as anything, it's about ministering to people. Kyle, come and share this morning. Did I get that on yet? Perfect. Perfect. Good morning. I don't really need this because I'm used to shouting anyway. Normally we've got like generators and motors and all kinds of stuff going at the racetrack. So that's why I brought my children for a little background noise so I could speak up a little bit. Um, but these are my two boys. Caleb is a little guy, three years old. You'll hear him the whole time. Uh, Micah is six years old and my beautiful wife sitting between them, Michelle. It's fun to be home on a weekend. Normally I'm out on the road. Um, let me get a feel first. How many of you like motorsports? You like NASCAR? You like racing? All right. I see a few hands, and, and I've got a little test prepared for us, just to make sure you guys are, are into it. You know the, the Jeff Foxworthy, you might be a redneck, right? Well, I got a few, you might be a NASCAR fan, if, just to see if we pick up any more fans along the way. But you might be a NASCAR fan if you think heaven looks a little bit like Daytona Beach, Florida. Got any fans on that one? You might be a NASCAR fan if you're not able to read the Richard Petty story, but boy, do you enjoy looking at the pictures in that book. <laughs> You might be an NASCAR fan if your wife's nickname is Lugnut. <laughs> you might be a NASCAR fan if you spend more time on top of the Winnebago than inside the Winnebago. Or you might be a NASCAR fan if you can change a, a tire about half as fast as you can change a diaper. So we pick up any new fans? All right. Well, I spend a lot of my time at racetracks around the country uh, with an organization called Motor Racing Outreach. Motor Racing Outreach, in essence, is the functioning church of the NASCAR community. So we've got a team of chaplains that I serve alongside, and we go track to track around the country, uh, providing a, a church culture for these teams and these competitors while they're out at the racetrack. What a lot of people don't know is you, you might flip through the channels on a Sunday and turn on the NASCAR race, and you see them out there racing the cars, but you don't realize what goes into them being out there. A lot of those guys have been at the racetrack since Thursday night, and they're going to be at that racetrack till Sunday night, and then they're going to pack up and they might have a day at home and then they're going to go to the next track. So they're a nomadic community and they live at the track. That's, that's their lives. They've all got their motor homes. Every week it's the same neighbors but a different backdrop, a different fence, a different concrete patio. So they've got a nomadic lifestyle. So we travel along with them to bring a sense of uh, stability to this crazy life. You know, they've got their families and their kids out there and they don't know what normal life is. Those kids don't know what it's like to come and sit in a traditional church to have a, a church community around them. So we attempt to bring that to them. Um, I could tell you a lot about it, but instead I've got uh, one of our board of directors on video, Daryl Waltrip, and he's gonna give you a kind of an overall look at what motor racing outreach is, and then we'll talk a little bit more about uh, the mission that we live and the mission that we should all be living in our own lives as well. So we can play that video real quick. Uh, me and Stevie, my wife, uh, Lake Speed and his wife, Risa, and Bobby and Kim Hillen at the time, and the six of us, uh, we, we wanted a ministry that had credibility in our sport. And that's not to diminish what other people had tried to do, but we wanted an, an ordained minister. We wanted someone that when he stood up on Sunday mornings at the chapel service and, and gave a, uh, read the scripture and, and gave a short sermon, we wanted that to be somebody that had credibility. And so the six of us got together and start our own little group. We'd meet on Friday nights at our, at the end hotel, 
and uh, we'd, we'd just do a little Bible study amongst the six of us. We wanted a ministry that was there in the good times to celebrate. We wanted a ministry that was there in the sad times, the tough times. So MRO was there for funerals, they've been there for weddings, marriage counseling, financial counseling, you name it. And, and we do it all. That's how we grew MRO was from that low key, meet you where you are, kind of the way Jesus did, you know, just uh, not condemning, not convict, not, not trying to, to, uh, to make you feel bad, just meet you where you are. You know, you can come here and, and you can be yourself and, you know, we're just real people with real problems and it's just great to have that support group. And, and like I said, it's tough when you're, you're sort of away from home, away from your friends and family. You don't really have that, that source of, you know, community. So it uh, really brings everybody together here. The sport's about racing. These people love racing. But just like everybody else, we all have issues that are going on in life that may relate to our relationships with our family, whether it's our children, our wives, or boyfriend, girlfriend relationships, whatever it is. You know, when somebody wants somebody to talk to, that's what MRO is there for, to be someone that you can talk to, someone that will listen. It's, it's taken a feud and diffused it. It's taken enemies and made them buddies. It's taken relationships that are broken and fixed them. Uh, it's, it's, it's done so many things, and it's all behind the scenes. You don't see Billy Malden, our president now, or, any of our, or Tim Griffin, or any of our chaplains out holding a hat out. You don't see us going around asking for anything. We're there to serve. That's what a ministry is all about. It's about serving, and we serve everybody, and, and I think we, we do an extraordinary job under the circumstances. You try to do a chapel service with 43 race cars warming up their engines on Sunday morning. You get a word in every other minute, you know, you got to wait for everybody to calm down so you can continue on. It's hard to do, but we do it well. MRO is the glue that holds this whole deal together. And, and there's a lot of things that go on behind the scenes. The fans at home, they see the glory, they see the checkered flags, they see all the good times. They don't know about all the things that go on back at the house. Our little community, that motor coach lot, where all the drivers and everybody stays and the owners and everybody stays. That's where MRO is at its best because that's where somebody comes into the family community center that we have. Maybe they drop off their kids for a Bible club and maybe they want to talk. Maybe they want to talk about a marriage problem. Maybe they want to talk about a job problem or a financial problem. We pray with them and try to help them uh, get some, get some, make some sense of their life and give them some direction. And so MRO is it's vital. It is so, so vital to this sport and, and keeping people in it sane. But I think they know whether it's myself or Tim or Monty or Melanie or any of the rest of us, but really the reason we're there is because we love them and we really care about them. And we know that there are answers to some of the struggles that we all have in life and we want to be there to help them when they want to sort through some of that stuff. You know, we've been there 20 years and uh, that's a long time and that's all we really, that's, that's our mission is to be there 20 more years. What we do right now is pretty simple, pretty straightforward. We're there week in and week out to help people. We just want to be able to continue to do that. So we have an awesome opportunity through Motor Racing Outreach. We're able to take a passion and connect it with purpose. The people that are at these racetracks week in and week out they don't come to the track because of motor racing outreach. They come to the track because they love racing. They live it, they breathe it, they drink it, their relationships revolve around it. Everything is about that race car and getting that checkered flag at the end of the weekend. That's what they're about. That's what their heartbeat is. That's what they live for. So we're able to take their passion and connect it and make it collide with a greater purpose in Christ through the involvement that we have in that community, through the, the opportunities that we have to be a part of the picture of what happens within NASCAR. It's an amazing thing to watch the ministry in motion at the track. And I'm gonna share just a couple of pictures of things that happen because I want you to see that the opportunities are around us to serve if we just look for them. But at the track, when the community center rolls in, we have our own community center that rolls track to track. Um, it's a toter home and this giant trailer that folds out with an awning that would cover, man, probably a, a good portion of this cafeteria in here. And when it rolls out, it becomes a kid's area where all these drivers and all these owners drop their kids off with us. And we get to pour into them and we get to do Bible studies with them. And we have fun. We'll bring inflatables and we'll do crafts and stuff. But they trust us with their kids. 
And if you can get a kid's heart, talk about the impact that those kids can have when they go back to the motorhomes. Beyond that, we've got Bible studies that happen with these drivers and with these owners that they'll get together in a, a motorhome on a, a Thursday night or a Friday night. And we'll be able to just sit and look and pour into them and to look at God's Word and how it applies to, to the uniqueness of who they are both as celebrities and as people. How do they take where they're at and make the Bible applicable to them where they're at? We've got women's studies that happen. I'll tell you, the wife of a, a racer can be a lonely person because that driver, um, if he's not in the car, then he's testing the car. If he's not testing the car, he's traveling around doing commercials and appearances. And that's a lonely, lonely person to be. And she carries a lot of the burden. So we have special studies that happen with them. Uh, we do studies with the media. Whether it's Fox Sports or CBS or NBC, we'll go out with them and we'll have Bible study with them on production day before they go out there uh, with vendors that happen. And then we have a, a big corporate worship service before every race where about a two hours, it's actually probably going to be happening here in about an hour in Texas, about two hours before the race rolls off, after a driver's meeting, uh, anywhere between 250 to 400 people from the NASCAR community will quiet themselves before competition and we'll come together and we'll worship our Lord together and we'll learn about his words and how it applies to us and then as soon as it's over then it's the game faces back on and they're right off to driver introductions and strapping into those cars to race. So it's a unique dynamic but it all came out of uniting a passion with a purpose. Darrell Waltrip who you saw in the video uh, is a NASCAR Hall of Famer and he was a, a NASCAR Sprint Cup Series driver for years and years and years. And motor racing outreach was birthed out of a purpose that he found in Christ. As he began to mature in the Lord and he was a part of that community, he began to realize that there was no connection that he could have to other believers in Christ. So him and Lake Speed and Bobby Hillen, who were two other drivers, came together and they created Motor Racing Outreach, which today has transitioned from just a couple of guys in a hotel pulling some chairs around in a room, uh, looking at God's Word to this vibrant ministry that's really impacting the entire NASCAR community. NASCAR community is probably 3,000 people strong as far as the people that work within the industry. And all those people are track to track. And now we get to be a part of that community. But again, it's about finding our passion and connecting it with our purpose in Christ. One of my favorite guys in the Bible is Ananias. Now, I'm not talking about the Ananias that withheld the money and was struck dead. Uh, I, might, I have a little higher role model than that. But I'm talking about an Ananias that we only get a little glimpse of in the book of Acts. So if you've got uh, your Bible with you today, turn to Acts chapter 9. I'm going to read this story for you. I'm going to read from the Holman Christian Standard uh, Bible, but whatever version, just follow along with me. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. He went to the high priest and requested letters from him to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any men or women who belonged to the way, he might bring them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he traveled and was nearing Damascus, a light from heaven suddenly flashed around him. Falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? He said. I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting, he replied. But get up and go to the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the sound but seeing no one. Then Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they took him by the hand and led him to Damascus. He was unable to see for three days and did not eat or drink. Now the curtain falls, and the curtain's going to rise again, and we're going to get to see this Ananias. There was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, here I am, Lord, he said. Get up and go to the street called Straight, the Lord told him, to the house of Judas and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, since he's praying there. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias coming and placing his hands on him so he can regain his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I've heard from many people about this man, how much harm he's done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he has authority here from the chief of priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for this, is, this man is my chosen instrument to take my name to the Gentiles, the kings, and the Israelites. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. So Ananias left and entered the house, then placed his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road where you were traveling has sent me so that you can regain sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. At once, something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he got up and was baptized. 
So when we pick up in Acts 9 here, we're at kind of uh, an apex of Saul's persecution on the church. You know, Saul, who eventually became Paul, wasn't that good of a dude in the beginning. He was going around systematically destroying the church, going door to door. Are you a believer? Taking you away. Are you a believer? Taking you away. Much of what we're seeing in Iraq and the Middle East with ISIS going door to door and marking the houses. Saul was a catalyst of that in these times. Saul was at the apex of that. Just prior in Acts chapter 8, we'd read about the stoning of Stephen. And Saul stood by and approved of that. So when we pick up in chapter 9, Saul is on his way to Damascus to do the very thing that he's been going around doing. And that's systematically destroying the church. And the people in this region knew that he was coming. That's kind of a scary place to be, right? I don't know about you, but if I found that, okay, now ISIS has landed in America, and they've come down to Spring Hill, Tennessee, where I live, and they're going door to door, I don't know about you, but I would be pretty terrified. I'd like to say I'm a bold and courageous man of faith, and that I'm able to stand for the gospel in all circumstances, but my knees would be knocking. Are you all with me? I would be scared. But that is why Saul is going to Damascus is he's going to be going door to door. He's already got the letters from the high priest that says he can drag off any follower of the way and have them arrested. Now, having them arrested isn't that bad, but we've seen it goes further than that. We've seen men stoned who were followers of the way then. We've seen men drug out into the street. You know, so it's a, it's a pretty scary, intense time. But as Saul's on his way there, we see the dramatic happen. The moment that we all experience at some point in our lives in Christ where we're going our way, we're doing it the way we want to do it, and all of a sudden, bam, we collide with the reality of who God is, how great he is. And we get a picture of that in Saul's life. We get this picture of this collision that he has as Saul is dead set in his way, dead set in what he's going to do. He was undeterred. I'm telling you, he wasn't going there with, well, I might go and, and drag people away. You know, we'll just see how it goes. Saul was going there with purpose. That was a long walk he was making. I'll tell you, I've got to be really hungry to get off the couch and walk to the fridge. This guy was so committed to his cause that he was willing to walk miles and miles and miles to go and drag these followers of the way away. So he was committed. He wasn't in this halfway. He was passionate about what he was going to do. But he had a collision with the Almighty, and God spoke to him. And now Saul found himself blind on Straight Street, hiding out in this house just for three days hanging out. Then, as I said, the curtain falls on Saul's story, and it rises on this guy named Ananias, a guy that we only get a little glimpse of it. So here's Ananias hiding out in Damascus, and he's just praying. It says that he's a disciple, that he's a, a follower of the way. So we know that, that his heart is after God. Um, but God, God tells him something. He says, look, you know about Saul. You know why he's coming. I want you to go to him because now he's on Straight Street and he's in this house and he's blind and you've got to put your hands on him and restore sight. Ho, ho, stop the train. You want me to do what? You want me to go to the leader of ISIS and put my hands on him and pray for him? You crazy. I don't know what you're talking about. So immediately he kind of questioned God. He said, hey, 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 you know who this guy is, right? You remember who, God, let's, let's talk about this. Let's have a, you know why Saul was coming. He gave him the letters. The, the high priest gave him the letters and he's coming. He's coming for me? And you're just going to deliver me to his hands? You're just going to send me out to where he's at? Shh, you crazy. I am not. What's God say? Go. Thankfully, Ananias was an obedient man. Because what did Ananias do? He went. He didn't look at, well, he did look at, but he pushed through the fear. He pushed through the, the, all the emotions that he was feeling in that moment. The apprehension, the fear, the, you know, am I just casting my life out here? But he was a follower of the way, and he was committed to fulfilling his purpose. And Ananias plays a small role in Scripture. Because when, when you read through Acts chapter 9, God doesn't even say, look, Ananias, I'm going to send you, and then I'm going to use you in grand ways after that. Basically, Ananias becomes a little pawn. And he says that Saul is my chosen instrument, and Saul is going to be used to, to reach the kings 
and the Israelites and all these people. Saul's going to be transformative in that process. And Ananias, all you've got is one little thing to do. You've just got to go and lay your hands on him and tell him that the Lord, you know, is with him. Easy job. And then you're done. You're scot-free. Not the big picture. Not the way a lot of us envision being used. You know, a lot of us don't envision being used in a small way by God. We, we picture being used by, like Saul, who became Paul, and being this, this great man of God or great woman of God who really makes a difference in the, the kingdom. I mean, look at the trajectory of Christian faith once Saul converted to Paul. Look at the, the amount of the New Testament that was contributed through his thought and his life. Look how Christian living in the church has been shaped by this man. It's pretty tremendous. We envision being used that way. We envision being the one that people can say, look what he did. Awesome. We've got these pictures in our minds of how God's going to use us and how he's going to take us. But we forget the role that we play sometimes as a catalyst for those things. What if, what if Ananias chose not to go to Saul? What then? Well, the interesting thing is, is that there was no plan B. That's kind of scary, right? There was no plan B. There was no way out of Ananias going. If Ananias didn't go, things could have been pretty messy. Why? Because we saw that when Saul was blinded and in this home on Straight Street, God told Saul, Ananias is coming to you. He said, I've sent a man named Ananias. He's going to come and lay his hands on you and restore his sight. So what would have happened if in that interchange between Ananias and God, Ananias said, you know what? I'm out. I am not going to put my life on the line with this foolishness. That guy is mean. That guy is scary. That guy is dangerous. That guy is going to take me to jail and possibly have me stoned. I'm gone. There's my noise I've been waiting for. I'm gone. I am out. I am washing my hands of this, and I am done. Not going. Well, God couldn't go say, Pastor Van, all right, you're going to have to go to Saul now because Ananias isn't going. Because if he went to Saul and said, hey, I'm Van, Saul would say, God told me Ananias was coming. Maybe that wasn't God that I heard. Maybe it was just that long walk without that delicious food I smell simmering in the background that's got me hungry and seeing things and hearing things, and that must not have been God. All right, guys, let's load up and, and move on out. Nobody could go but Ananias. He was the only one that could go. God had him on the hook. And Ananias' lack of obedience could have completely changed the course of the Christian faith. Not that God and Jesus would have been any less real. Not that his word wouldn't have gone forward in other ways. But I could tell you, I bet you that Saul would not have eventually converted to Paul if Ananias hadn't acted in obedience. There was no plan B. Sometimes in our lives, God hasn't given us a plan B. He's given us a purpose, and he's given us a passion to unite with that purpose that we've got to move forward in because we might be the only one that can fulfill what God placed on us. We might be the only one. Now, we talked a little bit about motor racing outreach and about what we get to do in the motorsports community. And to me, it's awesome. You know, it's an amazing thing to be able to walk into this environment, a racetrack environment, and if any of you guys have ever walked into a racetrack environment, I'm going to tell you it's not the most godly environment. It's not the most holy place. But it becomes that through the relationships and interactions that happen, through the way that we're able to be salt and light in that community and to give them a taste of something different and to illuminate in the darkness. And it's an awesome thing. It's tough being able to, having to leave home. It's tough having to leave my wife and boys behind when I go and leave the burden of the family at home on them. But when I get in there and I'm able to expose and let people experience, it's an awesome thing. So one of the things that I do when I'm heading to the racetrack is I take a lot of early morning flights. I'm talking early flights. And the reason I do that is so that I can minimize my time that I'm away from home. I don't want to have to go the day before and have an extra night away from my family. I'll go early in the morning if I have to to get to the track when I need to be there. So a lot of my flights are at 5 a.m. I live about an hour south of the airport. So you do the math on when I've got to wake up to head to the airport to get to the racetrack. And it's not, you know, not something that I enjoy. I don't like getting out of bed at 2.30 to go to the airport. 
It's just not fun. I mean, come on. Does anyone like getting up at 2.30 to do anything? So on the way to the racetrack, I kind of always do the same thing. As I'm driving, and those boys do not like getting up at 2.30. It was kind of nice. Yesterday I was home for a Saturday, which is unique. And I climbed into bed with Caleb, our three-year-old, and I think it was like 9.30 before we surfaced out of the room. And I don't know the last time I've slept that late, but it was nice. So on the way to the racetrack, I always kind of do the same thing. I pray, God, I hope that you'd use me at the racetrack today. I want you to use me to be salt, to be light, to be truth, to offer hope to the race community, to the people that I'm going to be with today. That's how I want to be used. Then I get to the airport, and I wait for a shuttle, and I finally make it on the plane, and I put in my earphones, because I don't want to be bothered. Who wants to have a conversation at 5 in the morning? I've still got morning breath. I haven't had coffee. I'm grumpy. I'm tired. I just want to put on my earphones and not be bothered. You know, don't pick up a Sky Mall magazine. If you pick up a Sky Mall magazine, you're just screaming, I'm bored and I want something to do, talk to me. So keep the magazines put, put on your earbuds and just kind of roll your head over and don't talk to anybody. Well, on this one five, five o'clock flight, this guy sits down next to me and I could tell he was a chatter. Chatters kind of have that look about them, you know, they're just kind of looking, hoping that they're going to catch your eye with you. And I wanted nothing to do with this guy. Five in the morning, I've been up since 2.30. I just want to put my headphones in, I want to sleep for my little hour connector to Atlanta, and I want to be done with it. Well, this guy wasn't having that. This guy wanted to talk to me, so he nudged me, and I said good morning, and went back to my business and hoped he would go back to his, and he didn't. So we ended up having a conversation together on this short little hour flight. And it was an interesting conversation. This guy was a guy that was just wrestling with God's call on his life. He felt like he was being called to be a, a worship minister. And he was running from that. He didn't want to do that. He wanted to be a country singer. He wanted to be in the lights and in the glamour. And we had this awesome conversation about God using us and how we move and we flow. Well, I got off the plane and I made it to the racetrack. And that day at the racetrack was just kind of a hum day. Nothing really happened. I didn't really have any great conversations with people. It was just kind of a day that at the end of the day, I was like, I could have stayed home today. I didn't really need to leave my family for this. So I came back home and... You know, that was that. The next week, alarm goes off at 2.30. I wake up, I get in my car, I start driving. God, use me at the racetrack today. I want you to use me at the racetrack. I want you to help me be salt and light and truth to everyone I come in contact with at the track. I get to the airport, I put my headphones in, and I get in my corner because I don't want to be bothered on an airplane at 5 in the morning. And another one of these talkie types sits next to me. Here we go again. I'm going to close my eyes and I'm going to block this guy out. He nudges me. Don't nudge me at 5 in the morning. You know, if I'm busy and I'm contained, just leave me alone and let me be in my misery. You know, don't, don't try and interact with me. But he did. And I said, good morning, good morning, and tried to go about my business again, and he wasn't having it. So I got into conversation with this guy, and this guy was interesting. This guy was a former serviceman that turned Buddhist. He was a Baptist man. Grew up in the South, grew up in the Bible Belt, grew up loving the Lord, went and served in Vietnam, met a young lady and converted to Buddhism. This was a big old Southern, Southern Baptist boy. I mean, he liked his fried chicken and he was a happy type and I would have never pegged him to be a Buddhist. But we had this amazing conversation about the lies that he was now following and the truth of the gospel. And he committed to me when he got off that plane that he would go back and reevaluate and reseek. Got to the racetrack today, that afternoon and again, it was a ho-hum day. Nothing really happened. No real meaningful interchanges. Uh, nothing of, of huge impact. I felt like I just went to the track and hung out with people. Came back home feeling like another lost weekend. Next Saturday, 2.30 alarm, driving to the airport. God, use me at the racetrack. I'm a slow learner. I don't get things very quick. So I get on the airplane. Put in my headphones. I don't want to talk to anybody. I don't want to be bothered by anybody. This is my third Saturday in a row. I had to be up at 2.30 in the morning. I'm going to be at the racetrack till midnight. Just let me sleep. The guy sits down next to me and he says, good morning, eh? I thought, I'm a Canadian. He won't bother me, right? It turns out he's a Canadian NASCAR fan that happens to know everything about the regional NASCAR series that I was traveling with. Now, the re I was traveling with a regional NASCAR tour at the time, not one of the big national series. And these guys are, you know, by all practical purposes, outside of their region, you know, the Carolinas and Georgia and the Southeast, they're unknown. Nobody knows them. 
Well, this guy from Quebec knew every single driver, knew all their stats, knew all their wins. I was like, how in the world do you know this? He's like, I just know. So we ended up having another nice conversation about just racing. But through that, I was able to tell him about motor racing outreach and what we do in the racing community. And this guy had never heard the gospel message before in his life. And I was able to share with him the truth of the gospel. I was able to share with him why we do what we do. We got off the flight, went to the racetrack. Nothing meaningful happened. I might have had a couple of good meals on a couple of crock pots at the trailer. That's one thing I can find is the food. And I'm trying to go fast because the food smells really good back there. <laughs> so I'm trying to move this along. Nothing really happened at the track. I went back home, felt like, man, I could have stayed home with my family this weekend. Week four, have I learned my lesson? No. 2.30, alarm goes off, get in my car. God, use me at the racetrack today. I really want you to use me around these people to be salt and light in that environment. Get on the airplane, put in my headphones. God said, all right, we're going to have to really wake you up to this. So I find myself in a conversation with a former Jehovah's Witness turned Eastern mysticism who's now practicing homosexuality. You want to talk about a tough conversation at 5 o'clock in the morning. You better be sure that that sword is sharpened when you're talking to this guy at 5 o'clock in the morning because he took me all over the place. Man, I felt like I'd run a race myself when we got off that plane. But he got some glimpses of the gospel through that conversation. And I don't know what happened when he got off that plane, but I was able to share some truth with him. And I got to the racetrack and had a really good day that day. But I began to realize that sometimes God has me go into the racetrack to be an influencer to the racing community. And sometimes God has me go into the racetrack to talk to someone on an airplane. And sometimes God has me talking to the race, go into the racetrack to have church with the, the rental car lady at her counter. And sometimes God has me go into the racetrack and forget my belt so that I have to go to the Kmart and pray with the person that sold me my belt. We never know where and why God wants to use us. Ananias probably didn't want to be used the way that he wanted to be used. I understand that because I had visions those four weeks of how God was going to use me. And God was going to use me to have this awesome moment at a racetrack and really let someone experience truth in life through what I was doing. It wasn't to talk to the person on the airplane. It wasn't to have to go to Kmart and hear about all the problems that this cashier was having. It wasn't to have to go to the rental car company and hear the, the rental car lady talk about how upset she was that she was stuck at that counter for two shifts. That wasn't why God was going to use me. Not me. Get over yourself, Kyle. God will use you where he wants, when he wants. Yes, you have a passion, and you have to connect that passion with a purpose and follow him. But like Ananias, sometimes our moments aren't in the bright, shining light. Sometimes our moments are just small moments of obedience that we have to walk in. And we don't know what that moment of obedience is going to mean for the course of history. Ananias had no idea when he went and talked to Saul what that would mean for the future of the Christian movement. No idea. He probably died not knowing the impact that his moment of obedience had. I have no idea what those moments that I've had traveling and interacting with travelers and workers and vendors and even people at the racetrack mean on the course of history. No idea, but it doesn't matter. What matters is that when God tells me to go, I now go. I might question him like Ananias. I might say, hey, you're asking me to do what? But when he says go, I go. And so many of us feel like going and being salt and light and going and making disciples that we can't do that if we're not standing behind a pulpit. And we can't do that if we don't have a, a fancy you know, prefix like a reverend or a doctor or something in front of our name. We feel like, well, I'm not an effective minister of the gospel if I'm not proclaiming him publicly like this. But God told us all to go. He called us all salt and light to bring flavor to illuminate darkness being a follower of Christ and making him known are inseparable we can't follow him and not share him if we are following him and we're not sharing him then we've got to reevaluate our relationship with him when that new iPhone came out everyone was going around iPhone evangelists I call them everyone you got to have the iPhone go get an iPhone you know 
Apple. If, you, if you're an Apple user, you want everyone to use Apple. And if you don't use Apple and you're just using a PC computer, then you're just not getting all that life has to offer. And these Apple evangelists will just hammer you till they're dead about why their product is so much better. But it's because they love it and believe in it. Are we as passionate about the one that we follow? That we make him known to everyone and in every way? Some of us find ourselves maybe in a law firm or in a doctor's office or working in retail or working in a, in a shop. And those outlets are where God has us for a purpose to make him known. Whatever we're passionate about, when we give that passion to him, it says that we love God with our whole heart, mind, soul, strength, and being. Part of that is looking at who am I and what am I passionate about. Well, for me, I grew up passionate about motorsports. So I said, God, here's one of my passions. And I can't use it for me. I'm going to just give you this passion. And you do with it what you want. I tried to use my passion for me once. I tried to be a race car driver. And it failed miserably. I found myself ultimately uh, being scammed by someone for $8,000 and being at the bottom of my road because I didn't take time to let God tell me how to use my passion. I did get a taste of racing once. Uh, there's a little speedway up north of Nashville called Highland, Highland Rim Speedway. And they invited me to come do a faster pastor race. Oh, it was awesome. They gave me just a little four-cylinder Dodge Neon. And I got in this thing, and I'm telling you, I was Richard Petty in this little four-cylinder car. I cranked that little mean up, but it sounded like a V8 rumbling under me. It was great. So I get out there, and I went for the win. I'm not going to lie. I wrecked that pastor in front of me trying to win that race. But, but we're to race to win, right? You don't get out there to race to finish second. So I wrecked him, and I ended up not winning anyway. The video says I won, but I digress. Uh, but we're all to race to win. You know, Paul said, let us run the race marked before us with perseverance and with endurance. Let us push on. Part of the race that we run is making him known. So let's do that to win. Motor Racing Outreach has an awesome opportunity within motorsports to make him known. Part of why me and Van connected and the thing that we shared was because of those relationships that have been built within motorsports. And oftentimes people look at what we do within NASCAR and they go, that's so cool. You guys get to do awesome stuff. You get to go out there and, you know, just hang out with these guys and share the gospel with them. That's awesome. And we forget that we're called to do that everywhere. We can do that at the softball game. We can do that at the Titans match. We can do that with our neighbors. But we put these blinders on about where God wants to use us and how he wants to use us. And we miss these little moments all around us to be salty to add flavor to the people around us, to be light, to illuminate in the darkness all around us. You know, these are some, these are some dark times that we're seeing in, in our world. There's a lot of darkness out there, but darkness can't be overcome by light. Light always wins, but if we're not shining our light, the darkness can win. So we have to be light, but we all have something inside of us. We all have a passion within us. My passion is to get that fly. <laughs> I will win. We all have a passion within us. We all have something that really ignites us, something that excites us. For the NASCAR community, it's racing. But we've seen it all over the map for people that are excited and impassioned about different things. Give God that passion and watch the purpose that he brings out of that. Watch the ways that he's able to connect people with his truth the ways that he's able to be known by just being obedient, by just following him and giving him all that we are and all that we love and all that we're about. You'll begin to see people transformed by that passion, by the, the way that we talk and the way we interact. We're all called to go out there and to be that. We're all called to be truth and life to those around us. It's not a suggestion. He didn't say, if you follow me, then maybe you can go and make disciples. If you follow me, then you might want to think about being salt. If you're my follower, you, you might want to consider being that light on the hill, the city on the hill, with the light that penetrates darkness. No, he said, you are to go. He said that you are salt. He said that you are light. So now we've just got to believe it and walk in it. We've got to stop waiting for those shining moments that we think that God is going to bring our way to make a huge impact and just walk in obedience and interact with the people that God sends our way. 
to cross paths with them and not be afraid. Take the earbuds out of your ears and talk to them. Stop praying for how you want God to use you and say, God, how can you use me? God, how do you want to use me? God, where will you use me? And when we begin to walk in that type of obedience, there's no stopping the gospel. There's no stopping the truth from rolling. And there's no telling the impact that our children's children's children are going to see years down the road. The time is now for us to make him known. The time is now to keep pushing forward. Ananias had to go then. Ananias couldn't wait. He couldn't say, well, I'll get around to it. I'll just wait till the time is right. I'll let someone else test out the waters first and make sure it's safe. God said, go now. And Ananias went now. It was about going where God was leading him and being obedient in that. I had the privilege with Daryl Waltrip and uh, the president of motor racing outreach that you saw as well, Billy Malden, um, to write a, now there's a gnat too. I love it. I'm not waving. Uh, to write a book called The Race. And in The Race, a lot of what we shared is how to live our life with purpose right where we're at with what we have. Stop worrying about where we're going and where we want to be. Stop worrying about our past and what's held us back. Letting go of past regret. Forgetting about future worry. And looking at where we are with what we have and how do we live with purpose now. So I want to show you a little trailer that we put together on that book. I encourage you guys to to pick it up and read it sometime because it'll challenge you as you walk forward. It'll challenge you. It'll go in a lot more in depth. I can only share so much in a, a 30, hopefully I only went 30 minutes. I don't know how long I went. I wasn't paying attention to the time. I can only share so much standing here, but I really want everyone I meet to get that, that where you are, you're there for a purpose. You're not there by chance. You're not there by mistake. Allow God to use you there. We aren't in the motorsports community by chance. We aren't in there by luck. We're there because God has us in there to make an impact. You're not on your neighborhood, on your house, with your neighbors around you by chance. Look at the opportunities and the people around you. You're not at your job by chance. God wants to use you where you are with what you have right now. So I should let you show that short video, and then, Van, you can come in and wrap up. race with Daryl Waltrip, you know, the stories that he can share. He's a phenomenal storyteller and he's had an incredible life. Uh, his road's not always been easy, uh, but it's definitely always been adventuresome. We got on our knees and uh, asked the Lord to forgive me of all the stupid things I'd done and all the people I'd hurt and uh, the troubles that I'd had and that uh, a fresh start. And so in July of 1983, I start on a new journey. What we're able to do is capture a lot of these stories from different chapters of his own personal life and then take these stories and show what God was doing in and through his life and how they're applicable to our own lives. And again, Daryl was not a full-time pastor or preacher. He was a guy growing up pursuing his dream of racing. And like many of us out here, we have our own dreams and our own things that are pursuing, even if it's just our career. And so the race takes the things that we have learned in ministry as motor racing outreach, just basic, simple, philosophical, tactical things that men and women everywhere can do to let everybody know how they can apply them to their own lives, how they can make a difference in their own workplace, how they themselves can be successful tent makers as the Apostle Paul was. Uh, there's a misconception that you have to be a pastor, or you have to be a chaplain, or you have to have a diploma on the wall, or a master's degree, or a doctorate to be a minister of the gospel. But the reality is, is that we're all ministers of the gospel right where we're at. Paul was a tent maker. That was his trade. That's where he got his income, but it didn't stop him from sharing the gospel. Here's real experiences, whether it's in the shop working on the car and you got to build the car by the rule book, or whether you're at the track and you get mad at somebody and you want to whoop them. You know, there's, there's examples all through the book of uh, when I blew it, but here's where, you know, here's the scripture and here's what, here's what you should have done or here's what you could have done. Our hope is the race as a book will inspire men and women everywhere, will encourage men and women everywhere, and it probably in some cases challenge men and women everywhere to not take for granted the opportunity that they have 
where God's put them to work. For anyone that's ever driven out of a church parking lot and seen the sign, you're now entering into the mission field. The race is for you. The race will equip you and teach you how to live in that mission field when you see those signs as you enter into the real world. And The Race is a tremendous book. I've read it. Uh, Johnny's working on it right now. It does give us insights into ministry opportunities, places that we wouldn't necessarily think of that we'd say, God, you, you put me here right now. You put that person beside me at 5 o'clock in the morning. And often, like Kyle, we're a little hesitant. Like Ananias, we don't want to go. But we don't know what lives will be lost because of that. We have to be faithful and simply say, I'm going to go, I'm going to serve. We know, just like Kyle in MRO, that many of the people they minister to will never step foot inside a regular church facility. They will never cross that threshold to come to this church. But that is okay. Granted, we want more people here. We want to have a, a larger number of people to worship with us that we can serve and minister to. We want that. But there will be many chances for us to minister, to pour in someone's life, and they will never come into this door. So we have to make sure we don't predicate our actions on, well, if we do this, then no one comes, and we shouldn't do that again. Because that's a, 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 false, mis it's a false truth that we could buy into. Some people say, well, you want to do it to grow your church. Yeah, we want the church to grow. But most importantly, it's about being faithful and serving. Christ wasn't going around and saying, Hey, you, come over on Sunday and I'm going to teach you some truth. You come. Now, if there were people who came to the temple, Christ is all about sharing truth with them there. But he wasn't going out and saying, We're going to have church service on Sunday. Come on over. He tried to meet them where they were, minister to their needs. And that's what we want to do. We want to be faithful about that. So Kyle, thank you so much for your work with MRO, what, what they're doing, not only in the NASCAR circuit, but also in the, the uh, boat racing circuit, airplane racing. So there's a number of areas that they are in that we often don't see on television. We just think of the, the top tier, but there's a lot of work they're doing around the country week in and week out. Uh, when I talk to him about coming, I know that uh, in the early part of the year that they'll be on the road again. This was about the only free weekend that he had where he could actually come and speak with us. So we really appreciate you taking time and Michelle, you and the kids coming and being with us today. Uh, but right now we're going to go ahead. Uh, we want to make sure that we always, always offer that opportunity for someone who perhaps doesn't know Christ or someone who says, God, you've been working in my life and I'm being called to recommit. Whatever it is, right now is the time for us to come forward to, to maybe just have that prayer time with God. Just to simply say, use me. Use me now.